Just a Friday here on Cape Ann today. Heather and I have more fun interviews to share with you as we start celebrating all things Viva San Pedro. Uh, right up the top, we're speaking with Nicole Kukuru and Chris Reed. Uh, their families for generations have had a deep involvement in the St. Peter's Fiesta. We're going to learn about the novena, uh, Cardinal Cushing, uh, the floats, the parade, all the prep that went into it, all the family and traditional stuff, too. Yeah, it was a pretty fun conversation. Uh, me and Nicole were cousins. Um, our grandmothers were sisters. My grandmother was Nina Conti, and Nicole's grandmother was uh, Vince or um, Gingy and Bernoni. So going back, um, the fiesta was started by Salvatore Favaza, who was the uncle or great uncle of my grandmother. And I believe it was his sister, who was Catherine Favaza, which was Rosie Verger and the rest of their family's mother. So my grandmother, together with Nicole's grandmother, early on would go to the St. Peter's Club when they used to have the St. Peter facing Main Street side, and they would take St. Peter together with Rosie Verga and her family. They would clean the statue. They would bring it upstairs in the hall and set up the altar. So that was, I think, the early introductions my family had to the fiesta um, directly, like from our grandparents. And then um, growing up, before they started doing floats, they actually would have people dress up in religious, as, relig as saints, as Jesus, to walk in the procession. And that's back when Nicole and I were young, and uh, we would walk together in the parade, um, dressed as like Mary, Jesus, saints, um, and that's how it was done in the early fiestas. And then after that, um, from the standpoint of the floats entering into the fiesta, every year my grandmother would pick a different theme and she would do a float out of her garage. She would decorate it. Every year would have a different theme. She'd get a bunch of people to be on the floats. Um, she even did it prior to me being born with um, probably Nicole's parents, my parents, um, and other members of our family. So she was involved in that level. And my grandmother was also part of the St. Peter's Auxiliary Committee, which was a group of women that were set up like the to be with the St. Peter's Club um, to function as a women's group of the club. So back in the 1970s, um, my uncle, Sam Linquata, who was on the Fiesta Committee, had approached my grandmother because at the time, Cardinal Cushing um, was having trouble. He would come to Gloucester to bless the fleet and he would change in the tavern just because of the close proximity to the fisherman statue. So he had asked my grandmother that Cardinal Cushion was getting older in age and it was becoming more and more difficult for him to climb the stairs to get into the tavern. So he asked, you're right across the street, you're my sister, do you mind hosting um, Cardinal Cushion and other dignitaries? And so Chris, there, we really should, I don't mean to interrupt you, but we really should point out that um, Christopher's grandmother, Nina Conti, Nina and Paul Conti, his grandparents, have the iconic house on the boulevard with the three porches and the blue and white and accents. Right. So um, Cardinal Cushion, and this was like in my very early childhood, um, Cardinal Cushion would come to my grandmother's house. He would change. He would come with bishops, um, the other priests of the churches of Gloucester, the Knights of Columbus, the police force. And my grandmother would just do an open house. And anybody that wanted to go to eat and to greet the cardinal, to kiss his ring, could go there to do that. So then after Cardinal Cushion, it went on to um, Cardinal Medeiros, who continued the tradition. So every year for the fiesta, it'd be this big barbecue. There was all these dignitaries and police, and we all got blessed every year uh, from them. And it was very intimate because he would like come into my grandmother's dining room and sit down. We could kiss his ring and have kind of a very small, like 10 people on one with him. Um, so it was a really cool tradition growing up. But then um, later on, after Cardinal Law had taken over, um, he decided that um, rather than change at my grandmother's house into the vestments to bless the fleet, he, he would go to the rectory at St. Anne's Church and dress into the clothes. So after that, he never really came over there anymore. So that kind of stopped. My grandmother continued on um, with the backyard barbecue every year. There was always people you didn't even know that showed up and would eat and everything. And it was a fun time. I do remember, I have very, very fond memories of every Fiesta Sunday at the Conti's house. And even some of the bands, the Italian bands that would come and were in the parade, would come down to the porch and play for all of us. And my aunt would just roll out the red carpet and all of her sisters, my grandmother being one of them, and they would just dote over anybody that walked in. It really was an open door policy that um, you were welcome there. It was a celebration. Um, she would set up the backyard with tables and chairs, and there was just hundreds of people, and we would be 
um, cooking in the basement and, and shuffling the food up um, through the rickety, you know, stairs. And it just was an incredible, incredible experience that we both grew up with. And our children have benefited from growing up in that environment as well. Yeah, I actually then, did a story in that house a few years ago. With I remember me. that with my aunt and my mom. Yeah, and we went through photo albums like two days. <laughs> it was awesome. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so very iconic. Uh, as a result of the um, of the Cardinals coming there for years and years, um, I think there was once or twice that Cardinal Law, after the blessing of the fleet, would come over and he would do a quick blessing to my grandmother. Um, and also in thanks for doing it for so many years. But I remember in the mid 90s when my uncle uh, Peter Conti had passed away um, that summer, my grandmother did not want to have any um, any barbecue in the in the uh, backyard and mourning and such. Mm -hmm. So I remember we were all sitting on the front porch and all of a sudden the Knights of Columbus came along and they created an arch with their swords to my grandmother's house and came up on the porch with the Cardinal. Um, to give a blessing to my grandmother and to offer condolences. So that was very touching um, when he did that. And that's all of a result of going back for the many years that she helped with the fiesta, with the clergy, offering up her house free of charge um, in, in the name of the fiesta. Very sweet. Well, and in the name of their faith. I mean, our grandparents right. were, were devout Catholics and they truly, um, this tradition came you know, from Italy, it was part of their heritage, part of their journey and their story. Um, and they really, they passed that on to us and we're just so blessed to have that and mm -hmm. to keep it going with our, even with our own children. Yeah, well, all I can think of is for two things, how much your grandmother had to clean her house before each of these events. <laughs> I think it was always clean. Was I think she was clean. always cleaning was one always portion clean. of her house. You could eat off the floor in the house. I am if sure. You, if you went to my my aunt's house or my grandmother's house and you asked for you know a glass of water or or a plate of pasta that they offered you, there was never a dish in the sink. There was never a dish in the dishwasher. It was they didn't have dishwashers back then. <laughs> That's amazing. True. Also, all I can think of with all that kissing of the ring in you know COVID times. Oh my god. <laughs> I mean, can, and all the years of doing that, right? And thousands right. of people. It's um, that's something to think about. So can you tell us now about the way the Novena tradition is continuing this year? Yes, so I am so blessed to be part of this amazing group of women that has continued on this tradition um, that has you know, been generations now. And so um, Jean Marie Linquata and Grace Cusimano and Anne Sanfilippo um, have continued the tradition. They took it on from Rosie Verga and as uh, Jean Marie has said many times, when Rosie calls you and asks you to do something, you know, you do it. It's Rosie's just this amazing person of faith. Um, and and any time you speak to her, you can feel her presence in the room. And so this year, um, more than ever, you know, we need to pray. This is a pandemic, and it's affecting um, our lives in so many ways across the the world. And you know, Gloucester you know, luckily has maintained a small amount of cases, but, you know, we're women of faith and men of faith that come and pray and to keep the tradition going, um, they decided to use YouTube this year. And so um, when I asked the ladies, I said, you know, I'm going to be asked about the novena, what, you know, what would you like me to say this year? And they, they really want to point out the unsung hero of Alex Sampleifo that um, went ahead and set up the YouTube the ladies got everything up and running so that all of us could enjoy and participate and pray um, during this most difficult time so that even though we couldn't be together we were able to be together yeah. and so Nicole for those who don't know right the novena is nine days of prayer yep so it's a nine day of prayer to Saint Peter specifically to thank him for the abundance of fishing work as well as anything that um, is provided to your family. It's a way to go and to pray, to honor St. Peter, to ask of something or to be grateful for something that your family has been given. In addition to that, a few years back, the women decided to start the rosary to the Blessed Mother as well as part of our nine day prayer. So we first pray in English, the traditional rosary, the meditating on the mysteries of the rosary to the Blessed Mother as well as 
the um, novena specifically to St. Peter. Um, and, you know, it takes about, it's about an hour of your time. You get together. Um, traditionally, we have um, been at the American Legion and this year on YouTube. And it's just that way of keeping the tradition, honoring, being of faith and praying for the world. And then the list of names of people that need prayers um, just continues to grow every single day and uh, every night of the novena and every year. And Nicole, you want to touch upon the floats, the float design and the history there too? Yeah, so Chris and I, as Christopher was saying, you know, our grandparents were very involved um, in the procession every year. So growing up, we were always in the parade with some kind of religious um, theme, costumes, um, every detail meticulously planned by our grandparents. And, um, you know, and it was just, you just grew up that way. Everybody was on it. There were years when we walked, there were years when we were on the back of, um, you know, a flatbed, a flatbed. And um, every time it was always had to do with um, a part of the Bible. So there was some significance, whether it be the Blessed Mother or St. Peter or the Last Supper. Our grandparents always honored a um, part of the Bible to show their gratitude and their deep faith. Mm -hmm. um, and we grew up with that. And for many years, I um, was fortunate enough to have a float with Anne Sanfilippo, um, my cousin, Joe Linquata, who's one of the same boat race um, trophies is named after his grandfather, which is also part of our family. So just always having that and passing that on to our children, I think has been really important. It's one of the times every year that I actually get to spend some time with Christopher and his family and his girls and my boys get to see their other cousins that we don't see as often as when we were younger. Well, they would, as, as Nicole said, every year they would do the floats on the Fiesta Committee. I don't remember how much, but they would give a stipend to whoever, whichever families wanted to put the float in uh, to help defer the cost of what went into it. And they'd probably spend like a month in their garages putting whether it was like paper flowers that they made or other material they would wrap around it. The white um, trellis that was like iconic right. on my grandmother's floats every year, that white trellis was, was part of it. I remember going down in the uh, in my grandparents' basement where my grandfather would be mending nets and behind the nets, there would be all these like wrought iron things that they used to make for his backgrounds and the trellises for all the floats just there in the background. Um, and then in later years, uh, my grandmother ended up joining up with uh, Leah Militello, um, who was the wife of uh, Santo Militello, who was on the Fiesta Committee, and they would create the float together. They would work out of Leah's garage, um, and then I would be in it. Liz's daughter, Kathy Numerosi, would be in it, and her other sisters um, back when we were younger. So it was a, it was a tradition where a lot of families back then uh, used to put the floats in. And as you've noticed in the fiestas of the past few years that that tradition has really dwindled down from what it used to be. Well, you know, it's interesting you say that, Chris, because we've been talking to people about Fiesta for the past week or so, and everyone brought up that maybe because it's not happening this year, it gives everyone a chance to like reflect and right. recharge, and maybe those older traditions or the traditions that are dwindling come back in full force next year. Right. I think it's really important. I think when you, when I look around the Legion, when we have the Novena, and I look at the amount of women that are in my age category, that are coming more and more year after year. And I think it's really up to that younger generation. And I think I said this to you last year, Corey, too, that the children that carry the oars, mm -hmm. think about those children and those memories that their families are creating. And more that young families step up and start to create some of the floats. And if you look at some of the, the pictures from years past, you know, it's not um, unmanageable. There, there are things that our grandparents didn't have. You know, there's Pinterest, there's the dollar store, there's, our grandparents did everything by hand with whatever materials they had at home. And Christopher's grandparents, the basement was this long, um, like L shape. And it had a huge table in the middle where we feasted many, many, many of holidays and many of Sundays. Um, but then there were storage units, like storage closets off of this, where this long table was. And as Chris was saying, that's where they would keep those trellises, the, the tissue paper flowers that we would make for hours and, you know, and on top of cooking and cleaning. And they just, 
they did it because it was from their heart. And I think more... I also think, though, in today's world, back then, all of our grandparents and everything, they were stay-at-home wives right. for or uh, housewives. So yeah. they had a lot more time to devote. And I think in today's very, very busy world, that it's not that people don't have the faith anymore to do, but I think that in yeah. today's busy world, to say, okay, I'm going to devote the next month to building this, you don't have as much time to put to it. I mean, especially like, like I work in Boston, for an example. And it's just like your commute there, your commute home, you don't get home until six o'clock at night. Mm -hmm. And so it's very difficult to put the time in. Um, but like Nicole said, anything is possible. And especially yeah. with not having the Fiesta this year, maybe next year we can look forward to a, a longer parade, um, more floats in it, more people devoting their time um, and the commitment into that. And I hope more of the younger families that have um, children that are in the um, the CCD program, the you know, religious education program at the churches, that hopefully more people will get involved. Um, but you do still have so many little kids that carry all of the oars, which I love that tradition. I love seeing that. And I also love the fact that many um, families have brought their saints from their town, um, from Italy, and walk in the procession, which is beautiful. And then you see the Brazilian community that, that um, lives here in town, and they participate. So all of these wonderful things are still happening and have evolved over time and changed, but yet they're still the same as part of the tradition. So I was looking, um, reading the text, and uh, I don't know if you have it in front of you, Nicole, but I thought it might be nice if you did, if you could read a little bit. I do have that prayer. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a prayer to combat the coronavirus pandemic. Most merciful in triune God, we come to you in our weakness. We come to you in our fear. We come to you with trust, for you alone are our hope. We place before you the disease present in our world. We turn to you in our time of need. Bring wisdom to doctors. Give understanding to scientists. Endow caregivers in, with compassion and generosity. Bring healing to all those who are ill. Protect those who are at most risk. Give comfort to those who have lost a loved one. Welcome to, to those who have died into your internal home. Stabilize our communities, unite us in our compassion. Remove all our fear from our hearts. Fill us with confidence in your care. Jesus, I trust in you. Jesus, I trust in you. Jesus, I trust in you. Amen. Isn't that a beautiful thing? Whatever faith you have, to hear that prayer is just so meaningful right now. Yeah, and you can look for that um, on YouTube. I said there's nine days worth, nine daily prayers. That's really part of the fiesta. Most people here think of it as the four-day festival, uh, but it really begins with that nine-day novena. So uh, thanks, Nicole and Chris, for that. Our second conversation is actually a look back to last year's fiesta when Heather and I spoke with Angela Sanfilippo of the Gloucester Fishman's Wives Association as part of our short and sweet food cast or whatever you want to call it. Don't know when we're going to do that again, Heather. Uh, but she was great. She spoke about all things redfish uh, and recipe books that the Fishman's Wives self produce. Hey folks, it is another episode of Short and Sweet, the food cast that celebrates all drinking and food in and around Cape Ann. I'm joined once again by my co-host, Heather Ratwood. How are you, Heather? I'm good, Corey. Nice and Bona Fiesta? Yeah, Bona Fiesta, exactly. Viva! Viva, yeah. <laughs> we have a very special guest for this Short and Sweet. We want to welcome Angela Sanfilippo from the Gloucester Fisherman's Wives Association. Thank you. How are you? Thanks for doing this. Oh, you're welcome. This is great. Yeah. Uh, these are, these are glorious day for Gloucester. And know. it really is. Yeah, special time. And hope the sun shines. I know. It just came out. Yeah, I it know. did. It just I did. came out. You know, it... last night, they had, we had the mass for St. Peter at the Legion, and then they bring the statue back to go to, and it was supposed to pour. And we were all upset. And they was like, we're not going to take St. Peter out because if it rains, the statue will get damaged. It rained all the off until St. Peter was in that window. Mm. And then started to rain again. Right. We were like, oh, you really wanted this to happen. Yeah. You know, and I'm sorry I missed the, that, the novena, the mass. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah. You know, we, we pray for everybody. Thank we you. We know that family <laughs> have all kinds of things going on in their lives. So we were talking just before we went on live is that you're, you're going crazy cooking right now. Yes. So what are you cooking? I just made um, 10 pounds of redfish soup. Oh. 
the Glossed House is going to serve it tomorrow night if they have a reception that with the St. Peter Fiesta Committee mm. and invite a guest. And I'm not going to be in Gloucester tomorrow morning, so I said I can only do it the day before, <laughs> which, is, which is why. So I, let's start with Redfish Soup, yeah. because uh, you are president of the Gloucester Fishermen's Wives Association. Mm -hmm. This is St. Peter's Festival, the celebration of the saint who watches over the fishermen, mm -hmm. right? And I happen to know that the city of Gloucester and the fishermen's wives are working with in, in um, underutilized species. Yes. And redfish is one of them. Yes. So let's just talk about that a little bit. What redfish is, what the fishermen are doing out there with redfish, mm -hmm. and how you turn it into soup. Well, and um, how we can eat some. I mean, <laughs> redfish, it's always been a real staple of Gloucester. The old people told us that redfish was the fish that fed the American servicemen mm. during World War II. It was landed in Gloucester and processed the Gordons and shipped to them. And until like late 80s, boats still could go out and catch redfish. And then something happened. The regulation said there was no more redfish, so for many years, nobody fished for redfish. Yeah, dormant, right. And in the last five years, has come back, They've allowed them to fish for redfish. And people just didn't even know what it was. People read, had forgotten about it. And so it's become an underutilized species, where at one time it was not. It was like the primary fish that came through the Port of Gloucester. Mm -hmm. So we had to not really invent new recipes, because in the fishing families, we, those things never go away. So. The redfish soup basically was a recipe for my, my mother used to make all the time. And the funny thing is we cook, if we were cooking for us, we would do a whole redfish in the soup. Because people don't know what to do with the whole redfish. Mm. How big we, is a redfish? Like this big? Well, there's little ones little. and there's big ones. Okay. Big, I don't think they go bigger than like 12 inch, you mm -hmm. know, foot. They don't go that big. And they're kind of a flat fish? And they're not so flat. They oh, okay. do have a, a body. This is why it's, you can get a good fillet good out, okay. of, uh, out of it. Mm. And so now our offshore boats, more than the inshore boats, are really bringing these in large quantities. They're, they're everywhere. The old Gulf of Maine, Georgia's Bank is just full of redfish. And, and so we've been promoting it with the city, and we have done the... Um, soup one mm -hmm. but we've tried out the recipes which they're great you know the little fillet fried a great uh baked with breadcrumbs a great done in a garlic sauce it's really great so there's many different ways that you can do it but unfortunately people just have their mindset on headache Cod and, and flounders and lobster. I was going to ask, uh, is it because it, they're thinking white in their mind? Uh, no, it's it's because basically that's what they grew up with There's, in the last 30 years. It's not 30 years before that. So when they grew up, they could not even catch redfish. Right. They were not allowed to. So people don't have the concept. A lot of people, they think it's red snapper and we just let it go. Okay, it's a red snapper. Well, the real name, uh, the fancy name for redfish is ocean perch. Oh, That's what it is. It's yeah. ocean perch. I've seen ocean perch in yeah. the market then. And I tell you, and the other day when we went to Minnesota um, in Minneapolis to do, to do the Dead in the Water documentary, and they prepared it, a restaurant that we served it, it was unbelievable. They wanted only all fish, mm. no filet. And the way they did it was they wrapped it in banana leaf. The redfish, the whole the redfish. Red, the whole redfish. They wrapped it in banana leaf and they grill it. And then they put it on the platter and they served it with some kind of sauce. And people went crazy. And, wow. and the redfish on the plate looks so beautiful. I have some pictures. Um, so it's... Whatever you are, you know, whatever the ethnic back, background of the community, like the chef who did that is, um, he is from some of Latin America, one of the Latin American country of the islands, you know. The, the ones that person. use banana yeah. leaves. Yeah, yeah. the ones yeah. that use banana leaves. Yeah. Said. Right. And I said, where can we buy banana leaves in Gloucester? I haven't been able to have time to think, to figure that out. I think but, Market Basket has them sometimes, actually. Yeah? Huh. Yeah. 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 So 
it, it's a fish that could be done in so many ways. And it's prepared. a white fish, and it's, and it's mild. A white, yeah. It's a white fish. It's a very delicate fish. Right. You know, it's not, um, you, you cannot overcook it. If you overcook it, just kill it. You know, it's, uh, and it's, but it's, it's a in fish. great abundance. It's available for people, you know, and, and what we tell people always is that if you go to a restaurant they don't serve, just ask and just say, oh, it would be nice if you were to serve some red fish. Mm -hmm. Or no. the fish market. Or the fish market, yeah, rice right. at the fish market. Because you're supporting Gloucester boats, right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I have a question. I want to talk a little bit about Gloucester boats, too. So here we are celebrating that the, the there will be the blessing of the fleet, fleet on, on Sunday, Sunday yes. right? So tell, can you tell us really quickly the history of the fleet? Like, what did it look like 50 years ago? What does it look like today? And could you tell us in a couple of sentences why? Well, what it looked <laughs> like 50 years ago was we had a large fleet, yeah. a couple of hundred boats. Yeah. Today, unfortunately, we only have 25 boats who fish for ground fish. Mm. We have a lot, lots of lobster boats. And we have the herring boats, but the ground fish boats are down to 25. Yeah. Only because of regulations. And uh, we are really working very hard to keep at least those 25. Because one thing we know for sure, there's plenty of fish in the ocean. Yeah. That will support even more than 25 boats. But we have to abide by the rules. And when I see, I've lived here for 25 years or something, and what I really see is that the fishing community is really a community. When those fishing boats are told by the federal government they can't go fishing, the impact on this community is huge. It's huge. It stops being a fishing town, right? Exactly. Yeah. You know, and I mean, if if Gloucester stops fishing, what would it be? What would it be? You know, we our identity, it's, we are a fishing community. Mm -hmm. Right, right. I mean, this and is all been, about the fish. You know, it's been like this for 400 years. It's been uh, Italian fishing community, you know, Italian immigrant fish community for 92 years. That this year is the 92nd year of the Peter Fiesta. So that's what it is. And uh, I'm sorry. No, you just, so now the Gloucester Fishermen's Wives Association is now and it's 50th year. This year's 50 years, right. yes. And so can you just explain that for people who may not know uh, what you're advocating for through the association? Well, the organization was uh, come together in 1969. Mm -hmm. A group of women, immigrants, first generation, a few, you know, Yankees involved, mostly were like daughters and, and wives and, and mothers of Italian-American fishermen. Mm -hmm. They got together because at that time, the whole world was fishing our, our waters. And they wanted that to be stopped. They wanted a declaration of the 200 mile limit, which became the Magnus and Stevens Act, so that all American boats can fish within 200 miles of the coastline. It took them seven years, but they did it. And that is really what has saved our fish stocks mm -hmm. because they were, as Lino Lovello used to put it, they were vacuum cleaning the Atlantic Ocean. The, uh, the foreign boats, the, the foreign big boats. foreign boats, yeah. Big right. factory trawls. They were not just boats, they were factory trawls. Yeah. The fishermen used to say that they never saw seagulls on top of those boats uh -huh. because everything that was brought in was pro uh, manufactured on the boat and, and divided, but they were covered. And so, that's what the fishermen used to say. There were not even seagulls on top of those boats. And you actually testified in Congress, right? Yes. On behalf of the 200-mile uh, limit? Um, not the original bill, no. It was other member of the fisherman's wife, because I didn't become involved with the fisherman's wife until 77. Okay. The law had already passed, and I was asked to go to a meeting to translate, because all the fishermen, nobody spoke English at that time. So Lina Novello called me, and she said, you know, we need you to this meeting to translate. And I was like, and, she, and I said, well, I, I talked to my husband. She goes, that's okay. Your husband is coming to the meeting, so you can come. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how I became involved with, with the fisherman's wife. And why do you stay involved? Well, because this is my inheritance. I come from seven generation of fishing. And funny enough, when I was a little girl, my grandmother in her own little fishing village in Italy, she was like me. So she used to take me with her everywhere she went. 
And so, and then when my grandmother died young, but my father was also involved in the community and taking care of the fishing families. So that was something that was in me, you know, and makes it just natural. And once you, I got a, at that meeting, I learned a lot in a very short time, but once you see the injustice that really has been going on for, for, 42 years, it's, it's it's something I just couldn't sit back and let it happen. Right. Are you, are you optimistic at all about the future of the fishing industry here in Gloucester? And what is I it am. to be optimistic about? I am because, as I told you early, we know there's plenty of fish in the ocean. Mm -hmm. The sacrifice that's been made have paid off. The regulation, we only pray, and St. Peter can have a part in this that we can enlighten the minds of the regulators and allow you know, more fish to be caught so we can encourage the younger generation to get involved because it's so hard. Uh, we let our children go. We told them, go away. You don't go fishing. You don't have a future. And now we see that really we convince them to stay away. But there is a future because this fish is out there and it's food. And somebody, if we don't go and, and fish it, who's going to do it? Somebody's going to do it. Yeah. Because then we have the Lord, the Sea Conference that says that when there is a stock of fish that is not being utilized the nation, by the nation where it belongs, it should be opened up to the rest of the world. And this is really what worries me. Right. Yeah. And I spent some time with Jojo. Yeah. San Filippo, who is teaching, he and other captains here are teaching young people how to mend fishing nets mm -hmm. and do really basic things. There's an interest there for people to get yeah. involved in the industry, but yeah. yeah, you're right. Like I remember my family telling all of us, like, nope, go, go away. Like the industry's not happening yeah. here. You, you had to go elsewhere. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But like you said, there is fish out there. Like there should be yeah. a robust industry here. And it's such a healthy protein. Let's it just is. It's dwell the only, on that for a second, the, right? It's the only left natural protein in the world mm -hmm. where you just get it and eat it you don't have to do anything to it right and uh, it's a help you know and we're so blessed because geographically Gloucester sits in the coastline it sits at a perfect location where both the Gulf of Maine is in front of us then we have still wagon bank we have George's bank we have Cassius Ledge all these very rich fishing grounds they're within short you know navigation mm -hmm. from from our city. It's also interesting. I mean, people think that um, your interests are in the fishermen, but by saving the fishermen, you're also protecting the oceans. And the fishermen's wives have done well, a lot of work well, you know, advocating for that ocean, honestly, right? Honestly, the fishermen's wives have been more environmentalist than they've been anything else. Huh. And we've been true environmentalist because we really mean it. And, and after all the years of experience that we've had with the environmental group, I really have to say, they're fake. They're Do you fake. want to give us some examples of the work you've done? Well, I, uh, well, you know, the first thing that came on board when I became part of it was oil drilling on George's Bank. There was a couple of years of a fight that we took all the way to, to the Supreme Court with Conservation Law Foundation. And then we went to Congress, and in 88, they passed the moratorium, which allowed that for 10 years, nobody could do oil drilling on George's Bank. Immediately after that, we asked to declare still wagon as a marine sanctuary for the protection of ground, you know, commercial fishing and sport fishing. Because sport fishing is a big business in our community too. So we had that done in '93, and then we turned basically to the New England Fishery Management Council because the fishermen were telling us that we needed to do something because they saw that the fish were were not in great abundance as they were early in the '80s. It took the council four years to do anything. And by then, it was tough. Mm -hmm. And they came down so hard on people that that's when we started to say Amendment 4, Amendment 5 to the Mangus and that. That's when we started seeing the boats leave. Mm -hmm. you know? and, mm -hmm. uh, and it's been a real struggle since then. Um, we have not increased number of boats. We've just been going down, 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 always with the you know, there was Amendment 13, and then there was Amendment 16, and we fought it to, 
to the end. But by then, the environmental people really existed. They were well positioned. They were well funded, and so they would sue National Marine Fisheries, and National Marine Fisheries didn't want to be sued, and they went along with them. And this is what we, where we are today. And I mean, right now, the thing that it's, uh, people are not aware of uh, that much, that is just this past year, 1,400 square miles of ocean was given to the windmill people. Oh, mm. Wind right. turbine in yeah. below Nantucket. This area, it's all on fishing ground, and it's whales ground too. Right. Well, but the yeah. environmental people say nothing because they got paid off. They got paid off $3 million mm. to do study. So yeah. they're not talking about it at all. Right. That's not right. Yeah. It's the not same right. organization that stopped fishermen from fishing, they're keeping their mouth shut yeah. about this. So, that, you know, the fisherman's wife have this belief that they really want the industry out because they need the ocean for everything else. Yeah. So it's, it's yeah. an uphill battle. Interesting, right. Really yeah. interesting. So before we get too close to the end, could you, you had told me a story about how St. Peter's, the celebration began. Could you yeah. tell that story? Yeah, I find out about this when we were, the fisherman's wife were working with Regia College to create a play called Six Pair of Hands, and it was the story of the fisherman's wife. And Grace Favazak was, was one of the founders, she's still a member. Um, Founder of the fisherman's wife. Of the fisherman's yes. wife. Um, well, it's, and Fiesta as well. Yeah. Um, she she told the interviewer the story how she remembers Fiesta started. And she said that Mr. Peter Favazza, who was an Italian immigrant in Gloucester and at a gear store, um, one commissioned the statue of St. Peter. In his hometown of Terracini, every year they would do a feast for St. Peter and it's a patron of faith, fishermen. So he commissioned the statue and the statue came and he had it in the store somewhere in the fort. So down, yeah, down there. Right yeah. across from Pavilion Beach, somewhere around there. And so one day he claims that as he went in the morning to open up the store, he looked at St. Peter and he saw this arrow around his head. So he told his son, young Peter, to help him bring the statue near the window so he could be looking out at the ocean and protect the fishermen. His son, like any teenager, complained and complained and complained. But he finally helped his father and put the statue at St. Peter next to the window, looking at Pavilion Beach and the Gloucester Harbor. Huh. Um, the day was over, they shut the light and they went home. The next morning, Mr. Favazzo goes to the store and he goes to look at St. Peter and he sees outside all the wives, all with candles and flowers, and we're doing the rosary. Amazing. Gracie remembers because she said she was a little girl and she went with her mother. And, and that day she was wearing no shoes because her family couldn't afford to buy her shoes. So Mr. Favazza looked at her and said, why should daughter no, have no shoes? And Grace's mother, very humble, said, you know, I have 12 kids. I just can afford to buy some. So he put his hand in the pocket and gave her some money and said, go get some shoes. Well, funny enough, Grace married the young Peter who didn't want to bring St. <laughs> Peter's really? into the window. And so she <laughs> became Mr. So Fama, the daughter-in-law. Wow. That's and, very funny. Uh, and when they did it in the play, it was just unbelievable, yeah. you know, beautiful. And, and for many years, the fiesta was, according to them, they would just do an altar outside in front of a house and they would say the prayers. Mm -hmm. There was none of Down this. Down on the fort here. Down the yeah. fort. Then when World War II came, they really, did, they told they used to do was praying, praying. And a lot of the Gloucester fishermen came back from the war and, and then they moved it to St. Peter Park uh -huh. and became this And it became big a event, much bigger event. Bigger event. That is a beautiful story. I yeah, it that. is. You know, it's, uh, and that's, so the fisherman's wife were involved all the time <laughs> and everything. That, Do you that have thing. any favorite um, food stories or just stories in general from Fiesta? Well, for us, Fiesta, it, my family, we came to Gloucester in 1965. Two years before we arrived in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where it was not a fishing town. And my father was very unhappy and he was gonna leave 
to go back to Sicily. But we had some friends in Gloucester who say, why don't you come by here before you leave? If you don't like, you can go home. And so we arrived here on June 15, and they were getting ready for fiesta. We had been, we have a big fiesta in my hometown to the Blessed Mother, the patron of the fishermen. So this was something new, not new, but it fulfilled that emptiness that we felt from our hometown not being able to have a fiesta. So it's always been something. Fiestas like this, you have to understand that they are a celebration of our faith. And we as Catholic, we do believe that St. Peter is the protector of fishermen. So who would not support that? And then I've had the pleasure for the last 45 years to always do the reading at the mass mm. in Italian. And I remember at the beginning, there was this bishop, it was to call Bishop Greco. He came from Alexandria. Um, Virginia? Not Virginia, somewhere in Alabama, Alabama Mississippi. Oh, okay. And yeah. because he spoke huh. Italian and he would come and it, the mess would be all in Italian. Huh. And um, then he got old and he, he came also, the last time he came, he was not, you know, a bishop anymore. He was very old and retired, but he still came for, for the fiesta. Nice. So did he do the blessing? And he did yeah. the blessing yeah. too. And yeah. then once he passed away, it was be more like the Boston Cardinal Madeiras and then was Cardinal Law and, mm -hmm. and, and I, I understand Cardinal Cushion used to come a lot too wow. during Fiesta before right. that. Yeah. So this for us is, like I say, it's a celebration of our faith mm. and, our, and our culture because being, being from any village in Sicily, once a year, at least once a year, there's a feast like this for the patron saint. Mm. And it's, it's a great time. It is. It is. Beautiful. Yeah. And so what are you doing for the weekend now? I mean, you've got, you must be wall-to-wall -wall plans here, right? And then, well, you know, the last few years we have taken it really easy. The kids are grown up, so yeah. we don't have to bring them to the car. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we do come down and just sit with all the Italian people, listen to music. But tomorrow night we'll be going to the Gloucester House for the reception mm -hmm. that the Fiesta Committee does. Friday, the very important piece is bringing St. Peter from St. Peter Club around and here at the stage. Mm -hmm. Saturday is just a leisure day, meet friends, go out to eat, whatever. And then, then Sunday is the big day, right. the mass, the procession, Great, yeah. which we walk into, you know, and then there's the greasy pole and the boat races. So we, we, we are in a good place right yeah. now. You know, my grandchildren will be here. I only have to my love children that they, they live out of town, but they be coming down. Yeah. And last night, my other grandson, Paul, who lives in Gloucester, was with us at the Legion for the Mass and the procession. That's so. nice. Nice, yeah. Well, bona fiesta, Angela. Thank yeah, you. And we bona really fiesta. appreciate you spending some time with us today. Anytime. And we'd love to chat with you again. If people want to learn more about the Gloucester Fisherman's Wives Association, they can visit gfwa.org. It's an old and website, but it's a lot of information. Right. And, and they right. have a great cookbook. A fabulous, oh, yes. if you want to learn how to cook fish the right way. The, the Taste Gloucester. of Gloucester. Yeah. We, we did it. They did it. I wasn't even involved when they did it. You weren't? They did it in 76 with the League of Women's Voters. No, but the one with Susan Pollock, you were involved. Yeah, that I one. was. That yeah. was the, that's the other big one, stories and recipes. Yeah, yeah. Right, right. But also, but the one that is all the fish recipes is the Taste of Gloucester. Yeah, that it's is the little one. one. Right. It's not even expensive and there is tons of the recipe for Great everything. fish recipes in there. You can still yeah. find that online too and everywhere yeah. around here as well. Yeah. yeah. There you go. Thank you, yeah. Angela. You're Thank welcome. Thank you so much. It is just so great to hear a conversation about food. We just haven't been there. So, Corey, can we do that sometime? Can we have another show about food? Yeah, I might just have to walk into a park now with like a fried dough and a, and a sausage, peppers, and onions again just to get the feeling. Yeah, we should just meet downtown and like find our own sausage, sausage and peppers and like sit in a bench. Let's do uh -huh. that. Viva fever, man. Everyone's got it. Well, we want to thank Nicole Kukru and Chris Reed for talk, for their conversation, which was amazing. And Angela Sanfilippo, uh, thanks once again. Hopefully short and sweet happens at some point soon. Hope you guys enjoy Fiesta Weekend. On Monday, we're going to speak with Erica Brown of the Manchester Cricket and State Senator Bruce Tarr, as we always do. Have fun. Be safe. Buona Fiesta. <laughs>